So we have one more minute, then we'll start up. We're just letting the last many people log on. So firstly, everybody, happy Thursday. And maybe we'll kick it off now. So everybody, this podcast is dedicated to learning about a certain aspect of women's health related to mental illness. And we're very fortunate to have the CEO of a company that's at the forefront of this tremendous unmet need. And we'll get into it in a moment, but let's quickly go through a few slides. So James, if you don't mind, go to the next slide, please. So, you know, we can't have a talk unless we have a disclaimer. So this is our legal disclaimer. And at a very, very high level, it basically says that Bridgepoint is allowed to give financial education. But if we give investment advice, that's regulated. And when it's regulated, you have to have certain key disclosures, et cetera. So this in presentation is designed to educate. So that's the na nature of this disclaimer. So go to the next slide. So just as a reminder, Bridgepoint has two key lines of business. And what Curio will be presenting today is within, frankly, both lines of business. So what does Bridgepoint mainly do? We have a business line that does private equity on a deal by deal basis. We call it SPV or special purpose vehicle basis. And transactions or opportunities like Curio fit into that business vertical. We also do private wealth management. That's what this podcast is all about. We call ourselves the BBC Mastermind Group. And we have members that are participating in that effort. And as a reminder, in a former life, I ran the global private wealth practice for McKinsey and Company for their partners, of which there are 3,000 current former partners in 50 countries. So those are my clients, and I would help them invest. And what you see here are the different services we offered and we do offer today. So just to be really clear, your net worth, which is a combination of your investable assets and your non-investable assets, that's one portion of the service or solution. There's also trust and estate planning. And just as a reminder, in America, anybody can sue anybody for any reason at any time. So the more money you have, the more of a financial target you have on your back. So you really want to make sure that your assets are properly protected, as well as asset transfers to your kids, your grandkids, or your charitable endeavors, whatever your desires are. But trust and estate planning is an important element of wealth planning. And then tax planning. By the way, I'm a former CPA, and I can promise you anybody can fill out a tax return. That's not where the skill lies. The talent in tax planning is that of planning, because you can actually quantify to the penny the value tax planners create for you. Because you'll know if you didn't plan correctly what your tax bill was, and if you did plan correctly what your savings was. So this is a really key thing that we offer. And I just wanted to say in that spirit, next week we have a session on private placement life insurance, PPLI for short. And we have a person who represents that he's the number one PPLI vendor in America. I can't tell you if that's true or not, but he's very big, very successful. And he's gonna educate us on his PPLI offerings. And this is something that I have a lot of exposure with from my time doing private wealth previously. It's a very uh, important concept to understand, but done right, it can have a dramatic impact on lowering your tax bill. And lastly is insurance, which dovetails into PPLI as well. So this is part of what we offer up for people that wanna be a member of our mastermind group. So go to the next slide, please. So here's, the two speakers, I'm gonna let Shailaja give a little bit of background of herself. And believe me, she's an amazing, amazing, accomplished professional. And I'm very honored to have her here today. So Shailaja, would be kind enough to tell us a little bit about your background? So uh, hello everyone, and thank you, Mark. Uh, thanks for joining everyone. I'm, my name is Shailaja Dixit. Uh, I'm a physician by training with my uh, master's in informatics and MBH MPA from Columbia University. I've spent. Oh dear. Shailaja, your audio went off. 
sorry. Uh, I'm okay. sorry. I don't know what happened. Uh, I don't know where I cut off, but uh, you know, um, like uh, I was just telling about my educational background. Uh, I have my, um, I'm a physician. I have masters in informatics and then, then MPH MBA from Columbia University. Uh, I still uh, teach as a visiting faculty at Columbia Business School. Uh, I have 20 plus years of experience in healthcare sector in various areas. I've spent time at insurance and uh, med tech with GE. I led the incubation group and what you see here on the slide, Allergan and Sanofi. I was uh, heading the global diabetes portfolio, which is a $5 billion portfolio for Sanofi at that time with a global team across the globe. Uh, for, for Lentis and other products uh, at Sanofi. Um, I, we formed this company about three years back, Curio Digital Therapeutics. We are gonna talk more about it. Uh, I have in the later part of my time at uh, Pharma, I have spent a lot of time on digital, what we call beyond pill strategy. And that's where the thinking around digital and the importance of digital came. Uh, and I'm glad to be here again. Thank you, Mark and Bridgepoint to invite us and thanks all for joining. We'll talk more. I just want to say one quick thing. You have your MD, you have your MBA. How do you have time to do your business work? My God, with all that education, you, I would imagine you're in the classroom 99% of the time. Very impressive. That's all I can say. Um, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, I think it was a desire to learn and understand the business aspect of medicine, which I think everyone should do before even practicing. So I was just fortunate to get that guidance early on. So. All right. Okay, great. Let's go to the next slide, James. Okay, so the way this discussion is structured, we wanted to have some conversation about the opportunity of this solution in the market. And it, on some level, it obviously sounds perverse to call it an opportunity, but we have a huge unmet medical need. And there's many huge unmedical needs, but today the medical need pertains to women's health. And I'd love for Shalaja to describe the opportunity that she saw and why she felt it was important to launch a company in this, in this space. And ultimately, how big is the opportunity from your perspective, Shalaja? So thank you, Mark. Uh, again, you know, what a time to be talking about women's health and women's emotional health. Um, there are two areas, two solutions that we have on market today. One is for pregnancy and postpartum. So supporting women during their pregnancy journey for emotional and uh, you know, a behavioral aspect, uh, specifically focused on postpartum depression, but it starts during the pregnancy. 20% of the women, one in one in five, like one in four or five suffer from postpartum depression. When you look at the entire emotional aspect, actually the numbers go as, as much as like 40% of the pregnant women need some kind of help. It's not just a unmet need, but there is a huge cost driver as well. And when you think about women in workforce, which is a big thing when we talk about, uh, you know, women getting like leadership position, it's number one cause of anxiety for women returning to work. Our second product around fertility slash infertility, the, the women or the couples who are going through uh, their infertility or fertility journey, as we like to call it, uh, number one reason after financial for any couple dropping off from a fertility journey is actually emotional and behavioral aspect. So these are two very big life stages of women that we are covering today, and we have plans to cover more, which we'll talk about. All right, terrific. James, go to the next slide, please. So, you know, um, I'll, I'll just uh, mention uh, briefly about this one. We are often asked, why, like mental health, we understand is a big crisis today. I think it's nothing unknown to many of us, but, but why specifically focus and have a company devoted to women's mental health? So there are a few reasons for it. First of all, you know, women have a different physiological aspect when it comes to mental health. So mental health affects women in a different way because of the physiological aspect. The prevalence is way higher. And unfortunately, about 
75% or so women who need some kind of mental health, they don't. So access and stigma are a huge issue as well. That's why a different approach, a dedicated approach to women's mental health is needed. And that's the whole basis of Curio Digital Therapeutic. So if you go on the next one, please. So uh, again, you know, what you see on the right side of the screen is actually our vision. Our vision is to go across women's life cycle, all the way from adolescent, reproductive stage, pregnancy, postpartum, menopause, perimenopause, and healthy aging. I already talked about the two areas. So number two and three quadrant are what we are focusing on today. And we have plans to go across uh, other areas as well. We are very fortunate, what you see on the bottom of your screen, to have some amazing research partners as well as commercial partners. So Columbia University, uh, Dr. Catherine Monk is one of our advisors. We have been working very deeply with her. University of Cumbria. So we also have international experts who we are working with. Mount Sinai actually are our early adopter and not just early adopter, they actually have a small equity in the company as well. So they invested in the company as well because they believed in the unmet need. Exia and Gallagher, are our early adopter commercial partners. So Gallagher is very large employee benefit management company. We have partnered with them to make it available to many self-insured employers. Exia is about 600 OBGYN practice across uh, United States. And we have recently launched with Exia. So this will be available to Exia patients starting like, you know, actually last week is when we did our rollout to Exia. So if you go on the next one. I'm gonna take a pause after this. I just want to explain like what the product is. And then I want to take a pause to understand if you have any questions at that point. So let me just go through this slide and then I'll, I'll, I'll take a pause to take any questions, Mark and uh, here. Uh, what do we have as a solution? So our digital platform is well, you see two icons. It's a browser-based as well as an app-based approach. A woman in her journey has to go only 10 minutes, spend 10 minutes, a very personalized modular learning. So we call it bite-sized digital dose that a woman gets every day. A program is typically for three months. Uh, some women do need to go beyond three months. We call it a booster program, but we have clinical data to show that we can bend the curve of two out of three women. It's very profound. We have a lot of clinical data to show that. Some women may still need a therapist touch point, but those are not more than 10%. So 90% of the women who are going through this journey are able to get this digital self-learning intervention in a very modular fashion, and we are able to see clinical improvement. So that's the whole program about. It is based on the principles of cognitive behavioral therapy, but we don't detach the behavioral aspect from physiological aspect. We do address the physiological problems as well at that stage of time. But the key program is surrounded around cognitive behavioral therapy, the principles of cognitive behavioral therapy. I want to take a pause here um, and see if there are any questions. There are some key features of the product listed on the bottom like learning management system, artificial intelligence, and a lot of like engagement and redemption engine, uh, which we have also incorporated in our platform. Uh, one last point I would say on technology, it's not an app, although of course from a user interface, that's what it looks like. It's actually software as a medical device, as we discussed in the previous slide, it's class one and class two device that we are looking at. So we have a full stack uh, technology, uh, which has quality management system and many aspects ready for FDA audit, uh, you know, from a technology perspective. I want to take a pause because there's a lot from technology um, and make sure that, you know, if there are any questions, I address them at this point of time. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you, Shalaja. I am happy to ask some questions, but I'd be more interested to hear if anybody from the audience at this point, we want to ask Shalish any questions about the opportunity and the product to describe. One of the things I'd like to see is the, which I'm sure you're going to do through the presentation, is um, the user interface experience. If you can go through that a little bit, I think that would be very helpful to me. By the way, I'll let Shalish talk, but we do have essentially a demo with a link to the demo which after this session, we're, we're constrained by time. We have an hour for the session. 
And honestly, we could spend a day on what Shiloh is doing. It's so exciting. But we have a demo, which we'll send afterwards. So people, I think it's 10 minutes, Shiloh, is that right? Yeah, it's, it's a five, 10 minute video. We will send you the link. It will walk you through the product, uh, you know, and you're asking a very important question because it's one thing to have a platform. It's it's totally another thing to make sure that users get engaged. And I think that's the beauty of adherence with digital versus any other pill, because we have an opportunity to impact and engage a patient throughout their journey. We have very quantitatively, uh, Russell, measured that uh, patient journey, and we are able to actually assign some points and nudge them and uh, attract them in a gamification uh, you know, throughout their journey. You will see that in the demo link that we'll send you. Thanks very much. Rob, go ahead, buddy. What do you got? Rob, you're uh, good. Oh, sorry, go ahead. You, I, I think you've identified a, a problem, and uh, you know you, what. What I'm hearing is is a, a a nice solution, but what I'm not what I'm not so sure about is the business, the business model, and how the company generates revenue. Yep. That's, uh, I, I think that's coming uh, in the next slides. Sure, uh, okay, no problem. Present this now, or, or Mark, if you want to go on the next slide. Uh, I wanted to make sure that for solution, if there are any questions, but that's absolutely a very important point. We need to generate revenue and I'm coming to that in a minute. Why don't, I'll, why don't we go to that slide now? Let's answer the question now. We can come back to the slide if necessary. Okay, so, um, uh, it's coming, but let me just finish the FDA one and then I'll, I'll address specifically the business model that we have. Uh, what you see here is, we, uh, as, as, as indicated earlier, we are seeking an FDA pathway. Uh, our first product, which is Mama Lift, uh, general wellness cleared, uh, you know, we self-registered with FDA. This is available today. We are in commercial launch phase uh, for Mama Lift. Our second product, Mama Lift Plus, is also available under enforcement discretion, but we are looking at class two device pathway with FDA. We have submitted our pre-submission dossier and we are in constant interaction with FDA. We, we hope to get that approval uh, sometime this year, you know, uh, since we have already submitted the dossier. Once we get our platform one approval, every other uh, product that we are planning to launch like perimenopause, menopause, will keep on referring to our first platform, right? So the things become easier in terms of approval after you get the first platform approval, okay? And I'm coming to your question. I've not forgotten that from a business perspective. So Mark, uh, if there are no questions at FDA, we can go on the next one so that I can answer. Let me just say one quick thing and then we'll go on if, if I may. My experience in therapeutics is it takes a heck of a long time to get FDA submission. A lot of heartbreak, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, but you're at submission. This is a major accomplishment. I don't want to undersell that. This is a big deal. And also, from my experience, I, I'll call the big pharma the vultures flying lady circles over the dead carcass. My point is, big pharma loves to swoop in once a product is approved because they have the muscle and the marketing discipline distribution to blow these products out globally. So they don't mind paying up post FDA approval because they can make so much money anyway. So the ability to monetize this investment post FDA approval, in my humble opinion, is very high. And I'm I have no doubt you're talking to, I'll call the usual suspects of big pharma that are doing women's health but I have zero doubt in my mind, you're gonna get offers to either license this product or be acquired by Big Pharma because you've been validated and they can sell your product around the world. So I just wanna put that out there, but let's go to the slide and we are going to talk about your revenue model for this the particular products. Okay. Whoops. So I, I, you know, I, I will verbalize the revenue model. Uh, let me let me do that. Uh, so first of all, Mark, you you rightly pointed out we have three large RC 
RCTs with 1,000 plus patients in a randomized, sorry, RCTs for randomized control trials, which you have to submit to FDA. And we all know pharma loves it because that's the basis of getting approval for any pharmaceutical product, as Mark said. Uh, we actually are in discussion with all major pharma players, and these are all inbound outreach that have been made to us. Uh, you can look up, like there are some companies who are working on actually specifically postpartum depression and fertility. So those all have been in discussion with us. Uh, you know, a very important aspect is that today, thankfully, none of the pharma companies is thinking about launching a product and digital has become a very, very important aspect for any product launch as well. So we would welcome that opportunity more from making sure that the product is globally available for more and more women who need the support. Uh, so they have the resources to do it and we'll welcome that kind of partnership in any shape or form um, as we move forward. Um, I want to make sure I address the business question which is very, very important and it's not in the slide but it was more because of the constraint of the timing. We have a very detailed go-to-market strategy our go-to-market strategy today focuses on two aspects. And you, if you recall, I'll go back to that slide. One is from provider perspective. And then the second one is self-insured employers because they are insurers for their, their employee case. And we have already established partnership with Gallagher. To give you an, a, a sense, we call them jumbo self-insured employers. Gallagher has about a close to 100,000 of more than 1,000 employee uh, employers in their, uh, in their, uh, you know, in their, um, um, in their, um, you know, uh, customer mix. So we are actually launching through Gallagher that gives us a huge outreach, uh, you, you know, to many of these employees and employers. And then the second goal go to market is through the provider. So again, you saw we have already launched with Exia that today we have an outreach to about 750 board certified OBGYNs. Our plan is to get to at least 10% of board certified OBGYNs by end of year. Uh, so, and we are well positioned for that, we are already very close to signing some other launch contracts as well. So those are the two ways that we plan to get revenue, one from the uh, provider side and primarily coming from the self-insured uh, employer side. I hope that addresses your question, uh, you know, and there is a very uh, uh, built out uh, forecasting model that maybe I'll be happy to share as well. Robert, are you okay with that answer or do you have any follow-up on that? So that, that's good for now. That's fine. Okay, uh, let me just do my own follow-up question with you, Shalaja. So you described the demand side of the equation of who you'll be marketing to. Have you thought about price you'll charge for your product? Yes, yes. Uh, we have a price for the product and uh, the price that has been accepted. So we did a very detailed willingness to pay kind of analysis. Uh, you know, that with large employers, we have a, a big market research actually was done by Gallagher, uh, you know, where we confirmed our pricing and that's the basis of our pricing that we are working with. Our uh, pricing model with a uh, provider also has been confirmed uh, and baked into our contract today. Uh, and, you know, the way, just to give you, we have, uh, uh, what we have done is a cost of one therapy session, right? So that's your benchmark to give you. If you replace that one session, uh, average person needs around eight to 10 sessions to see any similar impact, right? That's the value proposition. What we are saying, you replace one therapy session with our digital platform, you see better or same impact, and that's the price of our whole platform. So this has resonated very well because, oh, A, getting to 10 therapy session because we don't have enough therapists is near impossible in today's time. And think about a newly delivered mom. She does not, not have time to schedule those sessions, get to therapy session and whatnot. Here we are bringing the therapy to her at her click when she, her infant is sleeping or baby sleeping whenever she wants, only 10 minutes a day, which is a good mental break for them because they can go through meditation and other modules. And the cost is similar to just one therapy session. So this value proposition has resonated really well, plus all of the data that we already have for clinical evidence. So your eight, my simple words here, you're 10X more potent than an you know, in-person session, 
and you're bending the curve two out of three patients to get a positive result by going through this therapy. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's very impressive. Okay, thank you. Okay. We sort of took a sneak peek at the next slide, so why don't we just put it out there and just at least talk about the fundraising here. So go to the next slide, James. Okay, sorry, my bad. This is the product pipeline which we, we showed you. Okay, next slide. Okay, so it's always good to have a source and use of the funds. This is the world I've come from, the way I've been trained. So basically, Curio is doing their A round financing. They're doing it at what's called a pre money valuation of 35 million. And the target fundraise of this A round is $8.25 million, of which they've already received commitments for roughly 5.75, let's call it 6 million, just to talk around numbers. And this is before the seed round, which Shailaj did mention briefly, but the seed round raised about 2.25 million. So net net between the seed round and the A round, they'll have raised over $10 million of outside capital. And what's remaining in this round is roughly two and a half million dollars of fundraise. Now the question is, where does the money go and how long does it last? Firstly, this fundraise will give them a runway of two years. So they're you can do the simple math of what their burn rate is per month versus the two and a half million. You could come up with that number pretty easily. Um, they have two products that are expected to be approved in the market very shortly. And I can't emphasize enough how important that milestone is. And I'm gonna ask Rob as a cold call, having been a biotechnology analyst in the market for decades, how significant from your experience is getting FDA approval for the early stage biotechs. Hi, Rob, I'm sorry, you're muted, buddy. Uh, getting an approval uh, from the FDA is uh, significant in several ways. Number one, it shows that management can na navigate the regulatory process and complete all of the, uh, the, the steps in getting an application submitted properly, review, dialogue with the agency, and then final approval. So uh, once you have the data, you, you still have to go through the regulatory stage. And you know, the data uh, is, is one step, and then the regulatory is the second. So assuming that the data was, was uh, significant and it met all the clinical parameters for, for endpoints and statistical significance, you still have to compile this application, which is no simple task. That takes months and a lot of skilled um, interpretation of the rules. Uh, you know, if you, you had mentioned income tax earlier, and this is not like filling out uh, an application for, for a driver's license. This is a very uh, complex, shades of meaning, lots of data, and subject to review, scrutiny, and you know, they, they go over the data with a fine tooth comb. So going through that process takes negotiation, several steps, several meetings, and you know, culminates in approval, which is, um, you know, that's, that, that's like winning the marathon. You know, you, uh, that is a significant achievement for any management, uh, just in, in a, uh, just as an administrative task and a regulatory task. Then, then of course, uh, once you're cleared, you can start selling the product and then you generate revenue, which of course is the, uh, the whole purpose of, of doing it. And you can get your product out and start selling it, promoting it and generating earnings, which drive the company and drive cash flow and the additional products. So it's, uh, it's a major step in several areas. Well, very well said, Robert. So thank you for that. Sure. Um, I guess on the sources and uses, so we talked about the sources, the valuation, I'll just say investors wanna do good and do well. 
So clearly this opportunity is doing good for society. There's a huge portion of the population that needs this therapy. And financially, the question is, how would they do? Now, my own opinion, and that's strictly my opinion, is that once you have FDA approvals, I suspect you'll get offers, pure guess, starting at 200 million above, pure guess, okay? If I'm right, that post money valuation today of 43, converting into 200 exit, that's a five X return in a very short period. Now I'm sure as heck not guaranteeing that, and it's really my opinion, but I think those types of numbers seem reasonable to me. So I can promise you, once you have the approvals, you'll get the interest, which I'm sure you already have from Big Pharma, but they'll get really, really serious. And when you have more than one pharma competing, that's how you keep them honest and get it the best price possible. And this isn't purely about maximizing wealth, it's about doing good for the market. And I know you have your eye on both of those outcomes. And, you, and I think we're all fortunate that you came from Big Pharma. You, you've seen this movie before, you know their mindset and how the game's played. Absolutely. You know, again, um, uh, Robert, thank you so much for that uh, overview. I also want to emphasize that for software development, software as a medical device, there are a lot of technology aspects that you need to get ready as well. So your technology, database, everything has to be audit ready with quality management system, cybersecurity and whatnot. Uh, you know, in today's time, data security has become even more important important. So we have all of those third party certi certification that we have submitted to FDA. So it's, it's clinical data, as you said, it's creating that entire package, which is not so easy, but then uh, getting all of the aspects of technology ready as well. So it took us a while. That's why, you know, it has taken us two and a half years or so to get to that evidence data. But now we feel very comfortable with what we have submitted uh, yet to be seen. But, you know, we have a meeting with FDA fairly soon. Uh, we will know where, where we are heading. So absolutely. All right, well, thank you. I'm gonna open it up for some questions. If anyone from the audience would like to ask Shailaz your question, this would be a great time to do that. So feel free to raise your hand or ask a question. Mark, can I say one more thing? You know, the team is a very well-rounded and complimentary team. I, we didn't, didn't get a chance, but please visit our website to see the breadth and depth of the team. Uh, there are team members who have already gotten exits before with very, very large from technology perspective. You know, I was actually on the buy side at Allergan, one of my pro, uh, head of the product. Uh, she designed a product, so she has a lot of knowledge of making a digital product and engagement of the project. So it's a very very well-rounded team from that perspective that bring multiple dimensions. And all I can say is I feel very fortunate to have been able to gather this team together. So, um, you know, please visit our website as well to look at the team and who all are there in our team. So when we send out the recording after this call, we'll include the link to the product demo. And we'll also include your website so people can click on that and look at the team you're right at. I, I should have mentioned how impressive your entire team is. You're extremely impressive and you're right, but you have great people around you as well. It's not, it's not a one person team. Thank you for that. So again, I'll open it up for any questions or observations. If anyone would like to ask a question, this would be a great time to do that. I have a quick question here. Where do you see over the next uh, 24 months with this funding, um, what are your major challenges that you're facing, um, not just with competitors, but sort of go beyond that? Tell, tell us what, what your potential main challenges as you as you scale the company. Yeah, so that's a good question. See, markets are, are one of the things which we all know. I won't talk about that, right? Um, I also want to mention this, that some of the digital therapeutics company, uh, that is one thing that I often am asked a question. They have not done so well, okay? Uh, and the reason for that is there are multiple reasons. I think they went SPAC and public too soon. Maybe the timing was not right. So oftentimes I'm asked this question that what differentiates you? I think a very thought through uh, strategy of 
depth, looking at evidence, getting the right kind of approval, taking step-by-step -step approach and not rushing the things to market is what differentiates us. But making sure that we check, check, check those things in a really deep way uh, has been one of the, and just if I have to constantly justify this thing that why others have not done good. Well, they have not done good because I think they went to market too soon and did not have a proper uh, you know, evidence and other aspects uh, covered up. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Russell. Anyone else like to ask Shalish a question? Here's your chance. I'll, I'll just ask a, another question. In terms of the use of funds, what do you expect uh, the use in terms of the regulatory process or additional product development or, or general corporate purposes? How, how do you expect that to be divided? Yeah, so overall, our most of our um, money is going to spent in two areas. One is we have we are launching uh, actually now fifteenth uh, of July one pivotal study. Uh, so it will be you know although we do have money uh, carved out for that with our current funds, but we'll be launching another study for fertility. So a lot of uh, most of the money the funds will go towards the R and D. The rest of it is going towards the commercialization of our product, which is already in market. Uh, we do plan to have, we have already identified, she's going to join on 11th of July, a uh, chief growth officer who comes from women's digital health space of, of a pre IPO company and has a lot of experience in this area. So hiring those key personnel to, uh, you know, put more resources around commercialization. Our goal is we have made a goal of, approaching 10% of board certified OBGYNs by end of year. So mm -hmm. we already have, are at about 4% approach with 750. We got to get to like 10%. That's our own personal goal. Nobody has asked us, but we believe that's what we should be able to accomplish. So those are the two areas where we'll be spending most of our, uh, our financing. You know, we, we are very lean in terms of SGNA and other aspects. Uh, we spend most of our money in product development and creating the evidence. Great. And in terms of pipeline products or other products that would follow to the yes. market and any yes. others that you'd like to point out? Absolutely. So, um, and thanks for that question. Perimenopause, menopause is one, uh, you know, from an employer perspective, it covers all of their working population age group, if you think about it, from pregnancy to fertility to perimenopause, menopause. Given today's environment, we have also gotten some request actually to fast track contraception uh, aspect as well. So we are asking actually calibrating contraception we were thinking more towards end of next year you know menopause was actually before that but given today's environment if we are able to provide some emotional platform that can help women uh, I think that's something that we are thinking that can we recalibrate and do both of them a little faster but those two are the ones which we are looking at by end of next year we should have four products in market uh, postpartum uh, fertility this year menopause, perimenopause, and contraception was actually like we were looking at end of next year. We may fast track that if we can. You know. Great. I have to make a, just an observation, but you mentioned with your clinical trial process, you've looked at a thousand patients. That's a big trial. And you mentioned You've seen positive or significant, I can say it, significant, statistically significant outcomes in two thirds of that population. Those are true statements, correct? That, that is right. And actually, we can also go on the next slide because it summarizes some of these things. But, Mark, as you said, uh, you know, we have about actually 1,300 patients collectively in our three randomized control trials. I'm not even including the human factor study, which is required by FDA. So we also did a smaller human factor study. Uh, so in total, we have done actually five studies and three large randomized control trials with 1300 patients collectively in the study. And consistently in every study we have seen a statistically meaningful as well as uh, statistically significant and clinically meaningful. It is one thing to have statistically meaningful, but from a real world adoption perspective, it has to be clinically meaningful. 
meaningful as well, uh, which is, you know, we have a very quantitative uh, scale to measure that. The scale is something that FDA has agreed on is the right uh, endpoint to measure. And we have been able to see a clinically meaningful improvement. So both the aspect, and as you said, like, you know, two out of three, uh, I'm on a little bit conservative side because we didn't want to overpromise. I We promise and over deliver, that's what our approach is. So it's two out of three patients, we are able to bend the curve, like change their trajectory, going towards postpartum and then getting them down three, or three to four points uh, in the clinically validated scale uh, that we have used. So it's a very quantitative way because you can't submit to FDA if you don't have a quantitative way of measuring improvement. Okay. Just... Um... Just uh, one of the details, when you mentioned three or four points, three or four points out of how many? Yeah, yeah, and, good, good and point. How, how yeah. significant is that? Is this, is this yeah. a, a scale yeah. with different parameters or a yeah. one to 10? Or yes. what's actually, the name of the scale you're using? Yeah. The name of the scale is Edinburgh Postpartum Depression Scale. Okay. This is the scale that's used in clinical practice and approved by FDA. So there is a very uh, clearly defined cutoff value for those who qualify, who uh, are postpartum, how we define postpartum, which is 13 and above. And three point improvement is considered clinically meaningful improvement. So we are able to show a three point improvement. Most of the patients in our study started like 20, 21, and we were able to get them down three to four points below. And many patients, actually, we were able to get them down below the clinical threshold of depression, which is 13. Actually, you know, um, uh, our my, my chief uh, analytics officer has a ton of FDA experience, uh, has been involved in many, many approvals, like a, a lot of approvals, uh, you know, from, from FDA. And when we looked at the data, uh, it was, uh, it, the data is similar trajectory to any pill therapeutics. So the, the number that you see the difference between the control and the intervention arm are similar to any clinical trial of the clinical therapeutic, which may come as a surprise because we are talking about digital platform, but it has a similar impact, if not more, to any digital pill, to any uh, actual pill, sorry. Okay. Oh, that's, that, that's great. You know, if you can do this without using some kind of pharmaceutical, then, then that's, that would be preferable to most mothers. Absolutely, and think about it. These are like women who are pregnant, lactating. So of course the pill, and uh, as per the American College of OBGYN, the clinical guidelines say that uh, cognitive behavioral therapy should be tried as the first line of treatment. So we, the good thing is that we are actually aligning with the clinical guidelines and uh, proving that this clinical guidelines do work. That's why we have been able to get acceptance from OBGYN community because they see this as aligned with the clinical guidelines. Okay. Yeah. All right, Shalaja, we always like to have three or four key takeaways. Would you like to remind people what they learned today or what they should have learned today? Yes, yeah, so I think we talked about a lot of these things, but I hope I'm able to, first of all, convey the urgency and the unmet need. With that comes opportunity around women's health and women's mental health. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing is, while we talk about unmet need, it, we have a huge responsibility of, to bring the right kind of technology. So our technology is FDA audit ready. You know, that's really, really important for any application or software as a medical device that's out there. You know, we are not an app at surface. It looks like a user interface. So that's really important. The second we were just talking about is clinically meaningful and statistically significant results. So the data is there. We don't release anything without making sure that there's a lot of clinical data to support that. And third is, I think this question was also asked and very, very important question. While these two things are important, Equally important is user engagement or patient engagement. So we have augmented reality. We have some nudging architecture, gamification that actually invites a patient uh, throughout this journey and it remains. Uh, uh, we have some really good engagement data. I'll share that. 80% uh, of our users have been engaged and they complete the module 100%. Right, And then there are like 60% or so who do about 80% uh, completion of the program. So very few number drop off or don't complete. Uh, you know, we have a full engagement throughout our 
journey that we have measured in a very quantitative way. Okay. I just want to build on that final point, Shailaja, and I'm relating the past experience of my own company, but we were doing medicines for things like psychosis and medical compliance for people that need to take their antipsychotics is very, very low for. You know, if they took the pill, maybe it would work correctly, but they don't want to take the pills. And with your digital solution, you know that they're getting their treatments and you know it works. Unlike a pill where they go off the regimen and suddenly they have all their symptoms back. This is a major step forward for mental illness, in my opinion. Yeah, and, and Mark, I think that's where the digital plays such an important role because pill is just one slice of time of patient journey, right? They can interact. In our platform, a patient can have about 10 touch points every day to keep on engaging them, right? So that's where you are. You have an opportunity to constantly remind them to do the right thing and impact their behavior in a positive way versus pill is just one period and most of you are absolutely right. Achieving 80% compliance or adherence is a huge task for most of the pill. I also have to um, say one more thing that mom, a new mom usually wants to get better. She's desperately looking for a solution that can fit her, her, her changed lifestyle with a new baby, right? So there, there is also an inherent, some degree of motivation from a mom to get better and seek the right kind of tools. So um, when we actually opened our clinical study for online recruitment, within uh, 24 hours, we were able to fill all of the recruitment slots. That's how much motivated and, you know, and we are hoping that we'll see the same replication of, uh, you know, when we, as we are launching the product. Well, I can tell you from my experience, finding patients for clinical trials for most pharma companies is a, is a nightmare. It takes a long, long time. It's expensive. And it can take up to six months to get your recruitment targets or more. The fact that you filled your recruitment target in 24 hours, I think is a testimony to the market need and demand for what you're doing. So I think that's really exciting. Rob, you look like you wanted to say something, buddy. Uh, no, I, I was actually uh, looking at the, the uh, Edinburgh, Edinburgh depression scale and you know, just, just looking uh, at, at what it is, this looks to me, you know, and, and of course, you know, I, I, I'm, I've never given birth, but I have two daughters, so I, I was part of the process. People have been calling me mother my whole life, but still, I've never <laughs> given birth. But uh, yet, uh, you know, as I'm looking at this, this seems like a very easy, user-friendly type of thing. And for, for a new mother, who needs guidance and reassurance and is very uncertain, uh, the idea of going to a doctor and getting drugs or using something like this, that's software and behavioral health, I mean, there's no question, you know, the resistance to admit that they need help being a mother, you know, that almost the peer pressure to be happy with a new baby when they're not. You know, this is something they can do privately and without, without drugs, you know, without even addressing the idea of drugs have side effects or the efficacy that you mentioned, Mark, uh, you know, I, I can't imagine why any new mother wouldn't use something like this, you know, like, uh, like Dr. Dixa said, when the baby's napping or just in a break or, or something like that. This, is, uh, this looks to me like uh, a great thing. And the fact that you've got clinical efficacy, you know, this is like a, a, a slam dunk. And don't forget, if you're a pregnant mom that's lactating and breastfeeding your child, I guarantee some of that medicine is going through the milk to that baby, and that's probably not a good thing. Well, yes, uh, you know, that, that was like the, the the drug aspect that you know I, I didn't even we didn't we don't even have to touch on that. But yes, you're you're 100 percent right. And then just the idea of needing a psychiatric drug after giving, giving birth, you know, that's um, you know, not what most new mothers expect. You know, they're, you know the, the joy of giving birth and, and everyone's very happy 
it, it, that just doesn't fit. So there's a lot of resistance to treatment because of that and just the, the stigma. Uh, it's a oh. huge amount, huge amount. And you know, that that actually compounds because they think they're a bad mom because the, the process of giving birth need has to make them happy, but that's not the case many times. So the admitting the fact that I'm not happy uh, after giving birth, it's a huge stigma attached because they just say, oh, that means I'm really bad mom. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, that was something uh, you know, that I had seen, heard, and uh, you know, even in, in parents' magazines that I got when my daughters were born, you know, I could read articles just like that that describe what you were saying. And you know, it's it's not that you're a bad mom. This is just what's going on in your body. And most women don't know this. This is not something that's um, you know commonly thought of. It's people focus on the new family and the new mother and how happy it is but not the reality of postpartum. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. There is a question, I think, Mark, uh, I, I see that about gamification. Yeah, if you want so ba basically, Charles is asking a question, uh, understanding what gamification means in this therapy. I'm sure it has to do with engaging your target client and making sure that they're actively engaged in your solution. Why don't you tell us what it means? Yeah, yeah. So um, very briefly, we have points. So for doing the right thing, they can earn points. And so they keep on earning points, you know, uh, as they go forward and they're able to see how many points they're collecting and how they are doing. It also enforces a positive behavior. Uh, the second thing we have done is uh, in augmented reality, we put them in a scenario and we tell them to choose like, you know, what pathway you will see. So you are in a, now, now you are at a situation where you have to manage multiple things. So rather than thinking about negative thoughts, how exactly are you going to manage? And there are different choices. Each choice, they can take a different pathway and the end result of each choice is different. And at the end, we reinforce and tell them that you took an okay path, but maybe try to do this next time, right? So there is, and it brings them back to the, uh, environment itself and then tells them to play the game and you know choose a better option and so on so we are reinforcing using all of those aspects uh in our, our platform i hope that answers your question the the point and the augmented reality exercises that we have uh are the are the parts of our gamification okay it looks like charles liked your answer shall just so thank you yeah. and we're actually at the one hour mark or 58 minute mark. So I'm gonna ask James to go to the final slide and I, we're just gonna wrap up now. So if you wanna reach out to us, here's our contact information and we will send out a video link to this session and we'll include on there the product demo that we mentioned as well as Shalish's website where you can learn all about this business and what she's doing. And I just wanted to say, our next session next Thursday will be on private placement life insurance. So very, very different than a breakthrough medical therapy that we're talking about today, but it is about tax minimization, which is also a priority for people. So I hope people can join us next Thursday. And Shalaja, on behalf of everyone at Bridgepoint and the people on this call, well done, really enjoyed it. And you're doing some incredible work. So please keep it up. Thank you so much, Mark and Bridgepoint team and everyone who joined. I really appreciate it. And thanks for very engaging dialogue and um, uh, amazing questions. Truly appreciate it. Okay, everybody have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks Bye. everyone. Bye-bye.